All right. Everybody can see my slides? <clears throat> yes? Thumbs up. Go, okay. Science. Great. <laughs> um, thanks, Alfonso. Um, move some things around here. That's funny when we have Zoom, so many things on your screen. Can you actually see your slides? All right. Uh, thanks for letting me move it. Last week I was really sick, so um, I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, again, I'll be giving uh, a talk on um, some super cool sub zero high salinity incubations we completed on a marine model psychrophile for cold oceans. Um, and it's kind of cool. This is a, a very true to life collaboration. Um, we have expertise that spans four different departments at the University of Washington. Um, our whole team does reside at UW, where we've integrated cold active microbiology, ice physics chemistry, some bioinformatics and statisticians, and then my group, which is proteomics and life detection. And the published work has been led by my student, Miranda Mudge. And we have several members that span both RCNs, the now and NFOLD. The overarching goal of the research that we, um, we had that was funded through NASA's exobiology program was to reveal long-term metabolic strategies and detectable peptide biomarkers for life on other icy worlds. So I think we're all familiar with this image. It's an illustration of Europa or another icy world where we have a thick layer of ice that's overlying a liquid ocean. It's geothermally heated from below. Um, and when we know that you have to think ahead, so when we, we head to these different ocean worlds, we're likely to be limited to sampling purely on the surface of these oceans. So organisms sampled from this environment would be expected to have passed through that habitable surface liquid into an uninhabitable surface ice. Um, thus, it's important to understand the survivability of the organisms and biosignatures when they're transferred beyond their known growth limits for considerable periods of time. Um, specifically, they'll go to areas that are colder, more saline, and potentially nutrient limited. Now, to understand potential biosignatures in a new ocean world, we're using a psychrophile, a model psychrophile from here on Earth that lives both in underlying ice and, I'm sorry, in underlying ocean water and in the ice. In the ice specifically, if we look at it through a microscope, these bacteria live in these really um, narrow brine channels that get created as ice freezes. So in particular, these areas are salty, very cold again, and nutrient depleted. So our goals are to track those three aspects, high salinity, no nutrient sub-zero conditions. And we wanna gain insight as we, as we look at the proteomes or the expressed um, functions of these organisms um, we want to understand how the microbes maintain cellular integrity and viability over extensive periods of time in that condition. We want to potentially identify peptide biomarkers for individual and inter interactive effects of those three conditions. And then last, we're going to search for enrichments of three and four amino acid long peptides, so small peptide motifs that might confer the actual ability for these proteins to fold um, that are specific to cold conditions or very salty conditions. Now, my lab specifically focuses on mass spectrometry-based proteomics, and since we tend to be a diverse group from um, various departments um, in the info community, I'm going to provide you kind of with a one-minute um, mass spectrometry 101 overview. So we start with a, um, a group of cells, for example, or it can be an environmental sample. So we also work on rocks and sediments in my lab. We mechanically lyse or chemically lyse um, that organic matter and digest it with a known enzyme, and that generates a very complex mixture of peptides. We separate those peptides on an HPLC that's attached to a mass spec or a tandem mass spectrometer. Now, if we focus on an individual time point, um, these ions will enter the first mass spectrometer, and that yields a mass to charge spectrum of all the ions that are present in a mass range, and I'm showing you here from roughly 400 to 1400. Um, and this gives you basically an idea of what's there. We call it a survey scan. And using data-dependent ion selection, we can take the top most abundant ions that are present, we isolate them in the first chamber, and then we'll fragment them, and then we'll do a secondary scan in the second mass spec, and we get what's called a tandem mass spectrum or the fragment ion mass map. So in the results output file, in the results output file, sorry, for every intense um, precursor ion mass, we're going to have a corresponding fragment ion mass map. Now we collect roughly 50,000 MS2, so the interpretation of these is relatively automated. 
and it relies on one key part, and that is that peptides fragment in a very predictable manner. Um, so if this is an example of a tandem mass spectrum of a single peptide species, over here I've got relative abundance and I've got mass to charge, the distance between these ions or each fragment ion will correspond to that of an amino acid residue. So here we're seeing these pink ions, these are representative of the Y ion series, which retain the N-terminal um, end of the, um, the peptide. But we additionally will get a second batch of um, ions that are represented by this retaining the C-terminal. So again, we get this kind of corresponding method to identify what the peptide sequence is. And each one of these ions, again, then represents that series of amino acids attached that are part of that original peptide. Again, as I mentioned, we identify roughly over 50,000 MS2 per 60 minute experiments. So this is automated to do this de novo sequencing for these particular um, tandem mass spectra. So let's go back to the experiment. So the experiment was run where we grabbed Coelia. I'm going to refer to it as CP34H. Um, it was grown in optimal media condition at negative one. Um, that is then transferred to three different salinities that mimic equilibrium brines at different temperatures, negative one, negative five, and negative 10. These are then divided further um, and either amended with nutrients or not. So we have low nutrients versus replete nutrients. The incubations are then carried out at negative five, two temperatures, negative five and negative 10. And for each of those conditions, we generate five bioreplicates and we tracked activity, um, viability, cell abundance or cell number. And then at the end of the time period, at four months, we collected samples completely for proteomics analysis, where we're analyzing it on a Q executive or a commercial mass spectrometer. So we, in the end, we had a total of 320, 325 tubes that are tracked over time. So for the proteomics experiment, um, in, in really quick summary, we identify 2,362 proteins, and we quantify the relative abundance of those across all of these different conditions. So here's a PCA-like analysis where each point is actually representing 2,000 plus quantified proteins for each of the bioreplicates from the different conditions. So the beautiful thing here is that I've, I've shown you with both color and then also um, I've drawn vectors around them to demonstrate that the proteomics is revealing distinct protein profiles from the starting condition. So remember, we started at negative one um, degrees, and after four months, these all definitely discriminated from the original condition and separate from one another. Additionally, there is separation based on growth temperature. So we see clustering at negative one, negative 10, and negative five. And importantly, these negative five degree incubations retained a very high number of um, culturable cells, um, allowing us to examine not only the um, protein profiles of those that maintained high cell abundance, but we could also go through these and look at the exact metabolism to understand the effects of low nutrients, low temperatures, and high salinity. Additionally, if we look at negative 10 incubations, um, these had no, very few to no culturable cells in the end when we harvested them after four months, yet they maintained a very um, high cell abundance and visually, visually retained their cell shape. So are there enrichments in specific peptide motifs between three and four amino acids? That was the next area that we were interested in looking at. So um, we'll walk through exactly what we did with this data set to examine how potentially these small motifs can get retained for long periods of time and what that might mean for light detection. As protein chemists, we love heat maps. So I'm not going to walk through this, but this just demonstrates that we have different treatments up here and we have the different proteins that are identified. What we can do with the heat map is it allows us to look at relative protein abundances, only those that are significantly changing between conditions. We can do horizontal clustering and vertical clustering. In this particular case, we generated 12 clusters that allowed us to go through and look at specific enrichments of metabolic pathways that are related to survival. Um, this is, should be cultural ability, not capture ability. <laughs> we didn't have to capture on them, that was easy. Um, and cellular integrity. So I'll walk you through some of the things that we're finding. Um, specifically, if we look at negative five um, temperature conditions, so this is artificial seawater with nutrients, brine with nutrients, 
and then this is artificial seawater and brine um, with low nutrients. We can look at those that are changing through time. Um, log fold change is indicated by color, um, where eight is indicating a very high log fold change. So the constitutive response that we tend to see between negative five and the initial condition at negative one, we see increased motility in chemotaxis proteins. This is not that new for this particular organism. Um, it indicates that this organism is, is recognizing a chemical gradient and capable of swimming towards it, so motility in chemotaxis. We also see a very interesting metabolic shift towards an anaerobic state because they are trapped in these conditions for four months. And then if we walk through these different aspects, um, we can see that we reveal metabolic strategies such as in the artificial seawater with nutrients, we specifically observed an increase in iron and nitrogen transport and regulation enzymes. In the brines without nutrients, we see an increase in enzymes that are involved in fatty acid metabolism. But we also find other distinct signals that have not had their function defined, such as this one, but are yet very highly regulated. Um, so it's importantly, as we went through each of these different metabolisms, we were able to identify and propose potential biomarkers for those specific conditions. <clears throat> Our last goal was to examine the conditions that occurred, uh, sorry, the protein profiles that occurred at negative 10 degrees. And we wanted to determine if there's small, I had mentioned this before, these small polypeptide segments that can be significantly enriched in these experiments compared to all the other proteins we detected that indicate high salinity or negative 10 uh, degrees Celsius growth that are retained over four months of time and detectable via mass spectrometry. So we're trying to reach all these different aspects. The way we did this is all the proteins we detected at negative 10 were then in silico digested to three and four amino acid, um, three or four amino acid long peptides. And we did a frame shift of a single amino acid in order to account for the presence of each one of the variations across the entire protein. Um, we then did an enrichment analysis to determine if they're specifically synthesized, retained, or indicative of these conditions, either at high salinity, low temperature, or the computation of the two, high salinity and low temperature. Ultimately, we ended up identifying over 500 potential biomarkers or small peptide motifs that are more enriched in these conditions than the negative five or the negative 10 or any other conditions we've tested in the past. Specifically, we're seeing also that this lysine aspartic acid and alanine amino or peptide right here um, is present in all three of these conditions. We also did an amino, um, amino acid enrichment analysis looking at three informers, and we see that two amino acids, alanine and glutamine, are brine specific. Glutamic acid and valine are temperature specific, sub zero temperature specific amino acids that are retained within these peptides to help confirmation in salty or very cold temperatures. Now, more recently, um, we went back, uh, based on some of the newer papers, specifically this Marshall et al. paper in 2021, Nature's Communications, um, we were looking at the molecular assembly steps needed to make these specific amino acids. And I've highlighted here in red, those that reach about 15 or above um, and the molecular assembly steps indicating that these are have a higher probability of being biologically formed if we were to find these on um, on other plants. So we're proposing that these potential biomarkers um, could be used doing mass spectrometry, um, mission heritage based mass spectrometry and other things that are being under development, like what Ricky is about to show you. Um, that is all I have to present. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions after Ricky's talk, but it should be a nice lead into Ricky's. Am I stealing the ball now? Yes, if I know how to stop. Do screen not screen. share screen while other. Okay. There you go. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Now you guys can see the slides. All right, yeah, so that was a great, great start, which means that I can skip over all that bio, micro bio stuff and focus in on if, if, if the community believes that those are high value biosignatures, 
what's the best way to detect them or, or how can we detect them in situ? And so I'm gonna discuss what my group at the University of Maryland in collaboration with our international uh, partners as well as partners at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center have been uh, developing uh, in analytical techniques and instrumentation, specifically laser desorption mass spectrometry using an orbit trap for the detection and sequencing of, the, of peptides like Brooke just reviewed. And so uh, you probably saw this, this, this is a spoiler alert, but uh, Brooke asked me to be a guinea pig. So I'm gonna give you an overview of what my group has been doing in collaboration with Brooke, of course, to try to detect these prospective biomarkers. But she asked that this be a forum to invite conversation, constructive criticism, I think it was called, but really it's to debate. So I'm gonna present a straw man way of detecting these things. And I have tunnel vision, right? I, I live in the world of laser desorption mass spec, LDMS, um, but it's it's not the only way to detect these peptides. Maybe these peptides aren't your favorite biosignature, but that's all stuff that we can discuss afterwards. Um, so all, all of the <laughs> instrumentation uh, that my team works on, uh, it focuses on, on two subsystems. I'm gonna put the cart before the horse and talk about the mass spec uh, before the laser source. Um, so we develop, uh, we're working with an ultra high resolution mass spectrometer called an orbit trap. And uh, in the commercial realm, uh, they're very commonly found in pharmaceutical, industrial and commercial laboratories because they allow us to elucidate uh, molecular species that might otherwise fall underneath one broad peak. And so what I mean by that, it, I think you might be able to see my cursor, but a relatively low resolution instrument where uh, might see a single peak. But as you increase the mass resolving power of that mass analyzer, you might find that there's multiple different chemical entities underneath that peak. So as you increase the mass resolving power, you're actually able to see more uniqueness in your sample. So we've put a lot of focus on developing this orbit trap, which is a particular type of mass analyzer that offers mass resolving powers orders of magnitude higher than traditional heritage uh, planetary systems. So is there a critical need? That's one of the first questions we should ask. Yeah, it's a neat analytical capability, skinny peaks. I, I kind of get it conceptually, but is there an actual niche for this in planetary science? We can look at uh, synthetic and natural analogs to convince ourselves that this is a technique, this is a technology that really needs to be developed and flown uh, for future astrobiology missions. So here we're looking at a synthetic analog. It's an irradiated benzene ice, and you can see that there's a wealth of organic signatures here. And if you zoom in on a targeted mass area, uh, look at a couple of atomic mass units, zoom in again, and you can see that there's just a lot of structure. There's a lot of chemical diversity even underneath a nominal mass to charge ratio that might look like a single peak uh, with a, a, a low resolution mass analyzer. Natural samples, we can look at carbonaceous chondrites. This is a single extract of a single type of, of con, uh, carbonaceous chondrite. And this study found over 15,000 distinct molecular uh, combinations of the Chinops elements on top of isotopologs and other uh, complexity in there. So there's certainly a need to do it. And so it begs the question, how is high resolution mass spectrometry advantageous? I'm trying to like force feed you this right now because I am subject to tunnel vision because it's been my world for the last 10 years. Uh, but you might pose the question to me, how is uh, mass spectrometry, particularly high res mass spectrometry limited? As a, a broader perspective, rather than just throwing darts for or against this one single analytical techniques, we might want to consider what techniques are complementary to mass spectrometry. So these are things that we can talk about afterwards. Going back to the horse now that we've already reviewed the cart, uh, my group focuses on uh, laser desorption as the means for introducing analyte to that mass analyzer. So laser microprocessing offers a lot of analytical advantages. Again, I'm gonna give you the sales pick, the pitch because I'm in this world, um, but you don't need to make physical contact with the sample. You can get semi-quantitative detection of organic and inorganic uh, materials, anything that gets 
uh, ionized with a laser, you'll be able to see with your mass spectrometer. Um, because it's a micro beam technique, you can get spatially resolved measurements, allowing you to do chemical imaging, as shown in this cartoon graphic that my uh, senior graduate student provided for me. It's got low blanks. It's, uh, it's a destructive technique, but it's significantly less destructive than other techniques that we use in planetary science. So we might compare ourselves to a pyrolysis experiment, which needs uh, tens of milligrams of sample uh, per analysis, but a single laser shot only rooms on the order of a nanogram of sample. So it actually gives you the capacity to do 3D profiling as you drill into a sample as well. On top of that, you can do some cool things if you have a very capable laser system. Not only can you ionize what's in the sample, but if you have extra power available to you, you can increase the laser energy more than you need to ionize and intentionally break up that compound in order to fragment it and try to get some information about the structure. Or as I'm going to review for you, you might be able to sequence uh, a polymer or a sequence of amino acids. So LDMS isn't unique to my group. Uh, it's been appreciated in planetary science for some time. Uh, it provides access to refractory organic compounds. So this is a slide that we kind of go over. Um, I was part of the MoMA team, the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer on board the ExoMars mission. Um, and so they are one of uh, others that appreciate the breadth, the value of LDMS techniques. And this kind of brings home that if you want to see really complex, high molecular weight stuff, it's challenging to do that. You can't really do it with pyrolysis techniques because you're going to break down those those uh, molecules. Derivatization buys you some, uh, you're allowed to encroach that refractory carriage-like material, um, but there are limits to it. So laser desorption is commonly used, again, in uh, commercial, industrial, and academic labs for looking at this complex uh, material. And so here's just a slide that shows some of what we've been doing lately, trying to demonstrate. Again, we have this tunnel vision, so it's up to us to try to convince the community that LDMS is as powerful as I claim it to be. So here are some uh, analog samples that we've created. So um, on the left is a salty sample. So it could be representative of a Europa or an Enceladus sample doped with thymine and histidine. And what we can see is we can see the inorganic salt peaks. We can see the isotopic composition of the potassium in this single spectrum. And we can see the organic peaks as well. So we get that contextual information by getting the inorganic and the organic. We can get geological context. Uh, for any organics that we can see. And then we're looking at, again, our capabilities of doing quantitative analysis. So on the right, it's just a quantitative analysis of uh, the potassium isotope abundances. Of course, in astrobiology, we might want to focus on carbon isotopes, but potassium is a good case study for us. So again, some of the questions that as a community we should be asking is, how is laser microprocessing advantageous? Again, I that's the world I live in. So the alternative question is, how is it limited? What techniques are complementary to laser ablation and laser desorption? Presumably, you wouldn't want to just send that instrument on a life detection mission. And so uh, my, my group, which again, is, it's, a, it's a really big group with partners from across the globe, have been developing a couple of uh, proto-flight instruments, the corals instrument and the crater instrument. They have synergy and they all relate to what we do, which is it's a, they're all laser desorption mass spectrometers. They just have slightly different scientific uh, foci, if you will. Um, so corals is really geared towards uh, the biosignature detection on ocean world environments. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. But shown in the lower right is this has been a long-term project moving from the lab scale breadboard demonstration to things that meet the form and function to use NASA vernacular. So this is kind of a um, ETU kind of thing to protoflight units that meet the form, fit and function and can go through environmental qualification. So we're maturing this technology because it has so much to bring to the table. Specific to Brooke's investigation, uh, I ran into Brooke at Ab, uh, AbSciCon in 2018, I think it was. And before introducing herself to me, she jumped on me and asked me if I could see peptides. Could I see three, four, five, six amino acid peptides? And I hadn't, you know, our team hadn't tried at that point. So that's kind of where we had this natural collaboration. She sent us a subset of some of those peptides that she reviewed that could represent high value biomarkers. And she tasked us with trying to identify, can we detect these peptides? And more importantly, 
can we sequence them if they're prospective biosignatures? So here's just a couple of examples of the data we accumulated. So um, here's AAG and SKSR, which are two of those found in the Venn diagrams that Brooke represented. So they're associated with these incubations that went through either ultra cold temperatures or ultra high salinities. And in this single spectrum, we can see that we can not only detect the, the um, molecular ion, which is important, but we can see the diagnostic fragments that allow us to reconstruct the sequence of amino acids that comprise that. So this is a, a mix. We were able to see both in this case. We've looked at isolated peptides as well. So here's an example of a thremer SHD, which is a catalytic thremer, and then GDAE, which Brooke actually highlighted as one of those um, formers that requires 15 plus steps to create. So maybe that's a high value biomarker. And we were able to see the molecular ion in a neat sample. So this is just the peptide deposited on a plate, um, analogous to how we might em envision sublimating a sample from Enceladus or Europa. But in these cases, we weren't able to see the suite of fragments that are required to sequence the peptides. We see the molecular ion, that's great, but we don't know if GDAE is A, D, G, E, or some other you know, sequence of amino acids. So we were curious, okay, so we can see it in some cases, we, we don't see the, the diagnostic fragments in others. So there's a lot to learn um, with respect to advancing LDMS for peptide sequencing. Um, but one thing we were curious about was, is what about adding a matrix? So everyone, uh, not everyone, in the commercial realm, using an organic matrix is commonly used to increase the ionization efficiency and the preservation of uh, large macromolecular organics. Um, we don't necessarily want to fly an organic in a life detection mission where we're looking for organics. So we, in this case, doped those amino acids with an inorganic matrix. So these are just nanoparticles of silicon. And you know, the, there's been research published on how it enhances ionization via for uh, LDMS techniques, and we saw those benefits here. So adding an inorganic matrix allowed us to increase the sensitivity of the instrument to the molecular ion, and thus it also brought up peaks that were probably uh, be below the noise floor um, for the fragments that allow us to diagnostically um, sequence these things. And so some statistics are here definitely showing that this inorganic matrix enhanced the capability of LDMS. So it's something that we're very interested in and want to pursue because it, because it's inorganic, it could conform to planetary protection requirements. So again, some of the questions we want to ask ourselves from Brooks' presentation as well as mine is, uh, you know, one is how diagnostic are these three mers and four mers? So Brooke went over some of the foundations for why we think that they're pretty high value biomarkers, but um, you know, are they the, the be all end all? Are there risks for false positives? And of course, what supplemental information might increase the fidelity of these three emers and formers as biomarkers? So with that, I've got some take home messages. They sum up everything I said. I probably went long because I'm a scientist and I tend to ramble. Um, but I invite the, the conversation if now's the time for that. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Brooke. I think we're going to stop the recording now.